Okay, are you ready to start? Good evening. Greetings from the Chennai chapter of INTAC. I'm Sujata Shankar, convener, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to an enlightening evening. We're indeed honored to have two very eminent speakers, Professor Rajmohan Gandhi and Mr. N. Ravi, who will be in conversation today, delving into the nuanced aspects of the history of South India. A warm welcome to both of you. We dedicate this program to Keshav Desi Raju, who was instrumental in making this program happen, but who we sadly lost from our midst a few days ago. Just a brief about INTAC, an acronym for the Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage, which was set up in 1984, 37 years ago, as a non-profit organization. INTAC's mission, mission to conserve heritage is based on the belief that living in harmony with heritage enhances quality of life. And it is the duty of every citizen of India as laid down in the constitution of India. INTAC endeavors to achieve this vision by sensitizing the public about the pluralistic cultural legacy of India, protecting and preserving India's living, built, and natural heritage, documenting unprotected buildings of archeological, architectural, historic, and aesthetic significance, as well as of cultural resources. developing heritage policies and regulations, providing expertise in the field of conservation, restoration and preservation, encouraging capacity building by developing skills through training programs and undertaking emergency response measures during natural or man-made disasters, supporting the local administration when heritage is threatened. It is through the passion and strength of volunteers across 200 chapters nationwide, as well as the expertise of various divisions that INTAC takes this vision forward. At Chennai chapter, we have through programs and initiatives been creating awareness about the significance of our health. Since the lockdown, of course, we have switched to having programs online. After one of our recent programs, a talk by Mr. N. Vittel on the cultural influences of South Indian Maharashtrians in Tamil Nadu, we thought it would be wonderful to dip a little deeper into the history of our region. In today's conversation, two intellectuals, Professor Rajmohan Gandhi and Mr. N. Ravi, will explore how well South Indians know other South Indians. The discussion is based on the book, Modern South India. A history from the 17th century to our times, authored by Professor Rajmohan Gandhi in 2018. It is the story of the peninsular region of India, the facets of the four powerful cultures, Kannada, Malayalam, Tamil and Telugu, not to forget the other cultures who have influenced this region, Kodava, Konkini, Marathi, Oriya, Tulu, and other indigenous cultures. I have the pleasure of introducing both the speakers. Rajmohan Gandhi is a historian, biographer, and journalist involved 
in efforts for trust building, understanding, and human rights. He is currently research professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign, where he was early associated with its Center for South Asian and Middle Eastern Studies. He's authored more than a dozen books, including Punjab, A History from Aurangzeb to Mountbatten, A Tale of Two Revolts, India 1857, and the American Civil War in 2009, Gandhi, the Man, His People, and the Empire in 2008, Ghafar Khan, Nonviolent Badshah of the Pakhtuns, 2004, Understanding the Muslim Mind in 1987, and of course, Modern South India, the subject of today's discussion. His outstanding books on both illustrious paternal grandfather Mohandas Gandhi and maternal grandfather Rajaji have been widely acclaimed and won awards. In 2007, he received the Indian History Congress's Biennial Award for his biography of Mahatma Gandhi. In 2002, he received the Sahitya Academy Award for his Rajaji A Life. In 1990, he led the Indian delegation to the UN Human Rights Commission in Geneva. From 1990 to 1992, Rajmohan was a member of the Rajya Sabha. He served as president of Initiatives of Change International in 2009 and 2010. In the early 60s and 70s, he played a leading role in establishing Asia Plateau, the center of initiatives of change, formerly known as Moral Rearmament or MRA in Panchkani, Maharashtra. Before teaching at the University of Illinois, he served as research professor with the New Delhi Think Tank Center for Policy Research. During the 1975-77 emergence in India, he was active for democratic rights personally and as chief editor of the weekly Himmat, published in Mumbai from 1964 to 18, 1981. From 1985 to 1987, he was the resident editor in Chennai of the Indian Express. Through this virtual medium, may I say, sir, welcome back to Madras. Thank you, thank you. And Ravi, our person who will be in conversation with Mr. Rajmohan Gandhi, is the chairman of Kasturi and Sons Limited and publisher of the Hindu group of newspapers. A former editor-in-chief of the Hindu, he is currently the chairman of the India chapter of the International Press Institute and was member of the executive board of the International Press Institute, Vienna. He was president of the Editors Guild of India, chairman of the Press Trust of India, and is now director on the board of PTI. He was member of the international delegation, sorry, member of the National Integration Council, Government of India, and from 2006 to 2008 of the National Security Advisory Board. He is chairman of the Bharati Vidya Bhavan's Chennai Kendra, with whom he has been associated for over two decades. He has a master's degree in economics and a degree in law, and has won several academic awards, including a gold medal in constitutional and international law. He was fellow at the Harvard Law School in 2000 and the Shorenstein Fellow at the Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University in 2004. In 2013, he was visiting fellow at the Reuters Institute for the study in journalism and St. Anthony's College at Oxford University. He joined the Hindu in 1972, served as reporter, leader writer, Washington correspondent, deputy editor, and associate editor. He was editor from 1991 to 2011 and editor-in-chief 
from October 2013 to January 2015. He has covered several international conferences and traveled with prime ministers and presidents to cover international summits. He is the recipient of professional awards, including the GK Reddy Memorial Award and Bread Roll Memorial Award, and was awarded an honorary doctorate by the Sri Venkateshwara University of Tirupati. Welcome, Ravi. Over to both of you. Uh, uh, thank you, Sajata, for that generous introduction, which is all. Your audio, there's something. Can you hear me now? It's a little better, but it was cracking up. Oh. Thank you so much for that generous introduction. It's still not all right. I can't hear you at all. Is it okay now? Yes. Yeah. Thank oh, you. Okay. Uh, sorry, there's something wrong with my... Uh, thank you for that generous introduction. Uh, Intac Chennai has been doing wonderful work, not just in the conservation of heritage and setting the agenda on conservation, but also taking up broader issues of public importance. Raj Mohan Gandhi, apart from being the author of numerous widely acclaimed books, also writes regularly on issues of the day in the media. And he writes a blog in the website Himmat, named after the magazine that he used to edit in the 1960s, which I would urge you all to visit. Himmat has a wide range of his writings, and a sample of that would include Hindutva and India's democracy, Afghanistan and his neighbors, does the world care about what's happening in Palestine, and so on just to give you a, an idea of what Himat blog contains. I have read this fascinating book uh, twice over, first on Kindle, and then in this hardcover edition, which we're all used to and which we all prefer. A book, of course, cannot be separated from its author. And let me start with a personal question that I could not resist. Mr. Gandhi, your brother Gopal said once that long after he became a grandfather, he was invariably being introduced as a grandson, as a bearer of two great legacies of Mahatma Gandhi and of Rajaji. Do you feel the burden of expectations Uh, I suppose I do, you know, but it is now something that comes, it's part of, part of my life. So it has been there for a very long time. So I have almost, I don't, not even conscious whether I'm feeling a burden or I'm feeling not. But I have to say this, that long time ago, when I was in my early 20s, 
I made the decision not to worry too much about what is being expected. Uh, I, I don't say that I've always lived up to this resolve, but I decided that I will try to give my best and not worry too much about what people are thinking or expecting. And I was also conscious of the fact that most of the time people are thinking about themselves, not about me. So they're not really. So to worry about expectations uh, is not a, there's no need for it. But yes, it, it, is, it is true. It is true that, uh, you know, I, I have, people are kind to me, they're nice to me when they, they're aware of my ancestors. So I don't know whether it's a good answer, but yes, I'm conscious of this, but I try uh, for this not at all, for it not to bother me. Uh, as could be expected of the author of several highly acclaimed books, this is a grand vision and a majestic tour of South India. It is a book like no other on history and woven into it a rich, relevant and interesting detail drawn from multiple sources and presenting multiple viewpoints. Uh, Mr. Gandhi, could you introduce the book briefly, who you are addressing, the theme, the scheme, the issues that you deal with, were records available, how easy or difficult was it to source the material? I, I tried to answer this, but before I do, uh, Ravi, I can't resist this chance to do some boasting. Uh, uh, I not only knew your father, I met your grandfather uh, and his brother. Uh, so, uh, when I'm conversing with you, Ravi, uh, I, I feel that this is, uh, this is a very interesting and to me, a very meaningful uh, conversation. Secondly, I also want to say that uh, I uh, particularly remember Keshav Desiraju, who has recently passed away, this young man, who left us all before he should have left us. Uh, so those are some preliminary remarks that I wanted uh, to make. Now, on this book, it's very important to note that this is a book only about what I call modern South India, and in my definition of it, 17th century uh, to recent times. So it excludes what happens before. It excludes the Vijayanagara kingdom, for instance. It makes reference to it, of course, and it excludes ancient uh, South Indian history. So that's very important to recognize. And, and secondly, that uh, it tries in its own uh, limited way, uh, to cover as much of South India as possible, but the definition of South India is quite arbitrary. So I don't include Maharashtra in it, and I don't include Odisha in it. Uh, now the Marathas have had a very deep and long continuing interaction with all parts of South India. But in my uh, book, although the Maratha uh, inter incursions into South India, interactions with various South Indian forces, that fe those are fe featured, but the history of the Maharashtra part of India is not part of this story. And likewise, uh, the Odisha part. So it is restricted in geographical terms. Uh, the main uh, distinction I make, an obvious one between South India and the rest of India, that this North of India, and much of Central India too, much of Eastern India, India too, is powerfully influenced by the Himalayas. Whereas the peninsula of South India is powerfully influenced by the oceans. This is the primary geographical uh, distinction between these areas. Now, and there's so much uh, about uh, South India that one could have covered. Uh, now, since this is an intact uh, occasion, I must point out that historical monuments or art or architecture or music, uh, or literature, although referred to uh, and certainly uh, addressed to some extent, they're not the main focus of, of the study. And it, it has to be acknowledged that the political history of, of South India is, is the main focus. Now, uh, even that is of course, uh, too large an area for, for anyone to do justice to in one point, but I, I've tried 
to, as far as possible, uh, include not just one part of, of South India, one culture, but as many cultures of South India as possible. And uh, at least, so in doing so, I, sh I should also perhaps uh, uh, add this, that I, I wrote it for my own understanding, because my own understanding was very limited. It is not as if I had collected a huge store of South Indian history and now I'm finally uh, bringing it out. No, I had to locate it, I had to search for it, I had to research, uh, read other books, uh, go to very many libraries also, which I did in different parts of South India and in London. Uh, but there it is. Uh, it is limited. And within those limits, I've uh, tried to be as fair and as uh, balanced, quote unquote, as, as I could be, although no, uh, no author, no historian can be perfectly balanced, perfectly fair, perfectly impartial. Actually, from ancient times, there has been this consciousness about India as a nation, from the Indian Ocean up to the Himalayas, despite vast distances, forbidding territories and numerous political units. What do you think was the unifying element in India, India, the consciousness of India, travel to pilgrimage centers and awareness of other regions, religion, epics and mythology, empires, how loose, however loosely organized? And if there was a consciousness about India, was there a similar consciousness about South India as a unit? Um. Well, certainly there was a consciousness of, of India and the pilgrimage centers were the main uh, uh, evidence of this consciousness, no doubt about that. But I think we also know that political unity across India was sporadic. It was not a continuous thing. And it was there, there for limited periods indeed. As far as South India is concerned, um, Uh, I, th I would say that the Vijayanagara Kingdom uh, did create some sense of, of South India, but we don't know how deep that sense went to all parts of, of South India. Yes, there was uh, this very remarkable kingdom, 14th, 15th centuries uh, before my study commences, but that did leave a, a notion of South India. And then, uh, you know, the Madras presidency, which the British created, uh, also was a very interesting phenomenon. It did not include Hyderabad or uh, Travancore, Kochi, Mysore, uh, but Madras presidency did also create uh, the notion of something more than one linguistic area in the South. And so th there was, uh, some uh, suggestion of South India uh, through history, but uh, we can't say that a very powerful uh, political, uh, th there never was something called South India, the South Indian kingdom. There was the Vijayanagara kingdom, but there was no South Indian kingdom as such. Uh, so I, th that's how I would, for the moment, respond to your question. Uh, before we go into indi individual states that make up South India, let me take the southern region as a whole. On most parameters of development and social indicators, including health, infant mortality, education, and so on, the South fares much better than other regions and seems to be pulling away. Yet, there's also the sense of having lost political clout and administrative influence over the years. Some of the southern states whose populations are growing at a slower rate might even lose out on the relative strength in parliament to the 2011 census or the 1971 census who were to be used to allot seats. How would you explain this decline in influence? Well, the uh, numerical rule for selecting legislators and members of parliament is. Uh, has will go against the South because the South has done better in terms of population control. So I think that I'm sure will be challenged and questioned. It's not uh, something that the South will necessarily accept quietly. 
I, I don't think that will be necessarily uh, a reality a reduction of, of seats for the South Indian states. Uh, but over the centuries, it is true that while the North has shown a desire to control the South, the South has not shown a similar desire to rule all of India. And as I say in my, in my study that invasions or desires to control uh, move north to south, so more than south to north. Uh, Kanyakumari is more a magnet than the Himalayas. And so uh, for, for South, south India, uh, South Indians don't regard the, the northern extremities of India as a magnet to, to reach generally. So that has been the cultural, ideological, psychological outlook over, the, over time. Um, and, uh, and of course, there is of course, the question of language in Hindi in the South. And of course, it is the Dra Dravidian angle. Uh, but Southern political leaders over time, I'm speaking now of the last 150, 200 years also, Southern political leaders have yet to show the will, the resolve, the determination to be responsible for, to lead all of India. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, again, taking the South as a whole, leaving aside Karnataka for the moment, we can come to it later. Why is it that Hindutva and the BJP have not found much purchase in the South? Could historical trends explain the BJP's failure in the South? You should think so. Uh, you know, for, for, for one thing, uh, the freedom movement for freeing, freeing India from British rule, which is a very, very powerful movement all across India, uh, did not have uh, active participation from the predecessors of the BJP, from the Hindutva group that is now very strong. It did not have a strong part in the freedom movement. And for a long time in the, in the Southern states, uh, the successors of the freedom movement parties they're very powerful in, in South India. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, there was uh, in the South, uh, a, you know, the, the rule of uh, uh, Haider Ali and Tipu Sultan, of course, in some ways quite controversial, but we do know that Haider and Tipu uh, provided uh, an example of resistance to British rule even before British conquest was completed, which was a very powerful one. The only comparable resistance was offered a good deal later by Ranjit Singh in Punjab, but that was decades later. So in the, in the uh, 18th century, the uh, uh, movement for Indian if we think of it that way, of some kind of nationalism, resistance to European rule, is very powerfully led uh, by Haider and Tipu. And in, there were the, the other uh, revolts also uh, in Kerala and in Velour, the mutiny in Velour. And these were all connected to uh, Tipu's fight, Haider's fight. So there was this legacy of uh, some kind of resistance to European rule. Uh, and which, in which uh, Muslim figures were leading uh, influences. And this too had, uh, had a role. So, uh, and of course, there is above all the caste question and the Dravidian question. And the fact that the, in, in the South, uh, the freedom, rule, freedom movement was joined by an equally powerful movement for social justice. Uh, for justice for the non brahmins and for the Dalits. And uh, there again, the Hindutva-related parties before the BJP uh, did not uh, take part in that kind of social justice movement. So the nature of the freedom movement and the nature of the social justice movement uh, and the very great influence of uh, Peria, the Dravidian ideology, the Dravidian ideology was not as strong in 
Karnataka, or Kerala, or Telugu regions, as the Tamil regions, the, we did have a very large influence across South India as well. So these are some reasons, in my understanding. Uh, uh, now, coming to the exception, yeah. how is it that Karnataka has turned out to be more hospitable to Hindutva and the BJP? There could, of course, be many explanations, but could social factors or the influence of adjoining territories of Maharashtra and the North could uh, have played an influence, have played a part? Uh, I think so. And so uh, here again, uh, now my soul, because it was a princely territory and, and, and did not join the uh, uh, rest of India in the same way until much later. So he did not quite see uh, the uh, freedom movement uh, in the same way. Uh, that is one historical fact. Uh, and secondly, uh, I think the BJP in the more recent years uh, has been successful in using the very point I made, which uh, made the BJP less, uh, gave the BJP less of a foundation to begin with, namely, you know, the Haider Ali and Tipu in Karnataka, but they were able successfully uh, to portray Haider and Tipu as, uh, as bigots and as anti-Hindu. Uh, and uh, so they were able, and because of, uh, of certain aspects of uh, Hyder Ali and Tipu's rule, they were able to, to create an anti-Muslim sentiment uh, in Karnataka, which was not so easy for them to create in other parts of South India. Uh, turning to another political question, regional parties are dominant in three of the southern states. Indeed, in Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh, National parties have been edged out, and the main competition is between regional parties, the DMK and the AIA DMK in one, and the Telugu Desam and the YSR Congress in the other. And in Telangana, a dominant regional party has kept the national parties at bay. What explains the rise and dominance of regional parties in these states? Yeah. <clears throat> I imagine there is more than one explanation. Um, the Dravidian movement is one explanation. The power of film stars is another explanation, both in Tamil Nadu and in uh, Andhra and Telangana Tel region, and to some extent even in Karnataka. Um, <clears throat> the fact that uh, Hyderabad was a princely state, Mysore was a princely state. Uh, Travancore was a princely state. I think these are also important factors that have influenced subsequent history. I'd say. As a corollary, Karnataka and Kerala have remained exceptions to the rise of regional parties. I mean, how would you distinguish them from the other states? Um, okay. I think I need more, more time to digest this question, why uh, regional parties in Karnataka and Kerala have not quite succeeded. But in a sense, let's take, let's take uh, uh, Kerala. Um, the Kerala Congress, the regional Christian party, the Muslim League is a regional party. There, uh, the, uh, uh, the communists too, uh, yes, they may belong to a national party, but uh, where else apart from West Bengal and Tripura and there too, we, we don't see it much now. So uh, Kerala Communist Party is also, there's a very strong, uh, Malayali elements to the Communist Party of Kerala. And even in Karnataka, uh, whether it's the, the Lingayats or the Kaligas, 
uh, all those who want to consolidate against the Unites and the Republicans, those are all regional formations. So, uh, you know, the parties may still be called uh, Congress and, and so forth, but they, these are uh, now very strongly regional influenced parties. Um, and um, so uh, I don't know how, how fundamental this dis distinction is between Karnataka, Kerala on the one hand, and the Tamil and the Telugu areas on the other. Uh, linguistic nationalism and regional sentiment remain perhaps the strongest in Tamil Nadu, manifesting in the demand for state rights and so on. The term Dravidian, originally meant for all the South Indian languages, has not found much response in other states, but has been appropriated for Tamil. What explains the feeling that Tamil Nadu is in many respects distinct from the North? Um, well, I think uh, the Dravidian movement certainly was far stronger in the Tamil area than in the other parts. Although in terms of linguistic analysis, I think it has been conclusively shown that all the Southern languages uh, are uh, children of the of, uh, Dravidian family of languages. Uh, but this uh, linguistic reality does not quickly become a political reality. Uh, and there are many reasons for this. Uh, the anti-Brahmin movement uh, was very successful and strong in the Tamil area, more, more strong there. Not, it, was, it was not absent in the other parts of the South, but it was definitely much stronger in, in, the, in the Tamil area. So that is, uh, that is one, one, one factor. Um, and um, so I, I would say the, the absolute uh, passion with which uh, Periyar and his followers and his uh, very articulate, uh, culturally uh, brilliant uh, followers, another Eric Armanidi, and then uh, with MGR with his films. So the, the, you might say, what might be called very loosely or as, as imprecisely as is the Dravidian ideology, or, or the, notion, the notion that social justice was at least as important as political freedom, that became much more deeply rooted in the Tamil area than in other parts of, of, of South India, although it also had very good resonance in other parts. You know, some of the historical figures and events have resurfaced as modern controversies, as in the case of Tipu and Hyderali. Different images of Tipu as a valiant fighter against the British, as a tyrant who ordered the killing and forced conversion of Hindus in Karnataka and Kerala, and as just an opportunistic leader who was out to expand his kingdom have emerged. While recounting such accounts in your book, you also pointed out to his support to the Sringeri Mutt after it was attacked by the Marathas and for the Ranganatha Swami temple in Srirangapatnam. Is it possible to come with a definitive assessment or a balanced assessment of Tipu's role? I think, uh, yes, I think it is possible to come to a fair assessment, but I would say those who want to make a fair assessment have to understand that the past is different from the present. If we look at 18th century uh, Karnataka, Tipu Hyderali, uh, from the political controversies of today, uh, we would find it very difficult. Uh, if we want to find uh, the secular uh, Muslim uh, there in the 18th century, uh, we may not find that Haider and Tipu were secular Muslims, they were not. Uh, but we have to look at the 18th century from the, in the context of the 18th century. Uh, and what we have to uh, recognize is that uh, when Tipu 
was finally defeated and killed in 1799. The celebration in Britain, in the UK, were amazing. And whether we like it or not, whether we regard Tipu and Haider as, as bigots or, or, or not, it is a fact that in Britain at the time, when Tipu was killed, he was regarded in the same light as Napoleon Bonaparte. So that was the, uh, the level of his resistance and the impact it created in the UK. And as you yourself have mentioned about the Shingeri Mat and the Raghunath Swami Temple in Sri Lankapatna, uh, yes, Tipu was a bigot, undoubtedly. He was ruthless also. He was ruthless to those uh, who were rebels, ruthless. But to those who were not rebels, he, he protected the temples just right next to his palace. And, and he, uh, sent, and he, the Shingeri Mat, he had a tremendous relationship with them that is well established. And, and it's also wor worth noting that um, um, the point, uh, impo important point I was going to make, but I've kind of lost it. Yes, that, uh, anyway, I, I, I'll come back to that. But, um, you know, you have read the book more recently than I have. I, I read it some, some time back, wrote it. But um, anyway, there we are. If something more comes back to me. I, so in short, I will say, uh, we, the Tipu and Haider certainly were flawed. Yes, now I remember the point I was going to make. That the, the Brahmins of Karnataka, a great many Brahmins were in Tipu's employ and in Haider Ali's employ. They remained loyal to Tipu and Haider for a very long time, long after he was killed. So if he, if, if he was really so anti-Hindu, would so many Brahmins in Karnataka have been so loyal, so friendly, so supportive? Uh, and you know, when there was this rumor that his divan Purnaya was, was some kind of, had betrayed him, but no, no, they, they said, no, no, he did not. And so uh, the very fact that the, uh, that the so many Brahmin officials of Tipu, and of course earlier Haider, remained absolutely loyal to him for a very long time uh, is an important fact to recognize. But the main thing is assess Tipu and Haider, not from uh, our Hindu-Muslim controversies of today, the secularism uh, versus robust nationalism devote, debate of today. No, we must look at Haider and, and Tipu and the others. Uh, in the context of the attempt by the European powers to conquer uh, all of India and resistance by Indian rulers, Hindu and Muslim, uh, to that attempt. And that is where we should, uh, how we should assess these two. Uh, there is a similar controversy over the Mopla rebellion of 1921 during the Khilafat movement and the removal of the names of the leaders from the record of martyrs and history books. And this includes the wagon martyrs, some 70 of them who were suffocated to death when they were transported in a sealed railway wagon from Malabar to a prison in Bellary. The larger question remains, if the Mopla rebellion was a revolt against the British rule, an attack on oppressive landlords, or an eruption of religious fanaticism leading to killings and forced conversion of Hindus? And did it destroy the Hindu-Muslim unity that the combination of non-cooperation and the Khilafat movement had brought about? So here again, uh, Ravi, uh, we should look at this very important event of 1920-21 uh, in the context of that period and not assess it from our controversies and political debates today. There's no doubt 
Thank you, Mopla Rebellion. A, as you yourself pointed out, this wagon incident where so many Moplas were suffocated to death. That was as much a part of that story, story as the uh, assaults that they, some of the that fanatical Moplas did make on uh, non-Muslims. Non Very brutal assaults, many of them were. Uh, so that, that also is part of the story. And uh, but and, and and yes, the 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 non cooperation movement, the Khilafat movement, uh, was, ran parallel uh, to the local uh, injustices, local unhappinesses uh, of peasants and tenants uh, against landlords, and who often were Hindu landlords, and uh, so. The uh, there was there was there was certainly excesses, tragic excesses, and uh, so I, the, I would say this, uh, Ravi, that both with Tipu and and, and the Mopla thing, uh, I don't want people to get Rajmohan Gandhi's opinion on these controversies. Rajmohan Gandhi's analysis of these controversies is available in this book, in this book. And those who really want to understand my assessment of historical events are urged, are requested to go to the book. It is far more complex, far more nuanced than this or that, right or left, good or bad, evil or not so evil. The Mopla movement, had many excesses. The Mopla movement also, Apala movement, had a very great element of uh, struggle for uh, Indian independence, for Indian autonomy. Uh, and uh, so, so there were some, some remarkable things happened. And, and as far as the overall Indian scene was concerned, undoubtedly, uh, the excesses of the Mopla rebels and some of the intolerant and cruel uh, activities from the Moplas did damage the effort for Hindu-Muslim partnership across India. But at that time and for decades thereafter, uh, the, the, these uh, negative effects were contained. And Kerala continue, all parts of Kerala, the Malabar and the rest of Kerala continue to be part of the nationwide movement. Uh, so this is, yes, but now, you know, those incidents are raked up to create Hindu-Muslim divides today. That is politics. My book is not politics. My book is history. Those who want to convert history into politics are, of course, free to do so. But if you want historical information and facts, please go to, at, at least my assessment of it, I don't say it's a perfect assessment, go to that book. Uh, looking back at the campaign for the separate Andhra and the reorganization of states on a linguistic basis in 1956, does the separation of Telangana from Andhra Pradesh undermine the logic of reorganization on a linguistic basis? Yes, I, I mean, at first sight, you would say definitely that why should the Telugu speakers be split into two areas? So that would be a straightforward uh, you might say simplistic answer to your question. But then, you know, between Telangana and Andhra, there's so many other divisions. People may speak the same language and may have a deep emotional bond as a result of that. However, language doesn't unite everybody. Uh, in the North, uh, so many these people speak Hindi, but they have so many deep divisions with one another. And uh, as far as uh, the coastal areas and the interior areas of the Telugu speakers are concerned, there are tremendous uh, divisions and feelings on both sides. Uh, many people in the Telangana region felt that the uh, leaders of the nationalist movement, uh, Telugu speakers in coastal areas, uh, were not fair to the interior hinterland Telugus. And uh, there were various attitudes of superiority. There was also richness you know, because of water and, and the, uh, the dams and the incredible rice cultivation. Uh, in the deltas, Godavari and Krishna deltas. So uh, that created great prosperity in those areas. And the hinterland 
Telugu speakers uh, felt deprived. So those are also aspects that are real. Uh, going back to Kerala, except for the brief interlude of the Mopla rebellion, the religions are more or less balanced within Kerala and there's not been much of religious strife. But now some new fault lines seem to be appearing in the religious uh, area. For instance, the recent controversy is sparked by the statement of a Christian priest on love and narcotics jihad. For the, indeed, the very term love jihad was coined by the Kerala High Court judge in a case. Do you think the soil of Kerala would allow such sentiments to spring? You know, we should never believe that any wonderful soil automatic, automatically dissolves very deep tensions. Uh, there are, uh, there is ignorance, there is prejudice, the history of tensions among all kinds of groups, including between Muslims and Christians. Merely because Muslims and Christians are both non-Hindus does not mean that they necessarily have deep love for each other. When Vasco da, Vasco da Gama first came uh, to the Kerala coast, uh, he came with a very strong anti-Muslim sentiment. He was surprised and shocked. The Portuguese were surprised and shocked that the Zamorin in Malabar had the support of many Muslims and the Muslims of Kerala and the Zamorin, the Hindu ruler of Halicut. Uh, they, they worked together. Uh, but yes, there were deep, deep, deep differences among uh, Christians and, and Muslims also. Uh, but now I think, uh, uh, A, there is a recognition that uh, minorities have to work together and to live with one another. So despite the fact that Kerala did show an amazing, uh, you might say, not necessarily wonderful uh, fusion of everybody, but some kind of uh, arrangement, pragmatic arrangement of, of working together and sharing uh, political influence, political power, growing up together economically. And of course, there was this amazing thing, the, the Gulf. And so many people from Kerala, including Hindus, including Christian, not just Muslims, went and found jobs, lakhs and lakhs of them in sent remittances. So a great deal of unity was forged that way also, but new, new problems also created as, as, were created as a result of that. So uh, yes, there, there is tension, there are divisions, but there is also uh, not only the recognition of, of Kerala's unique uh, place uh, is having so many Christians, so many Muslims, so many Hindus, uh, people of different castes also. So yes, Kerala has a wonderful opportunity to continue to show something to the rest of South India and rest of India. Before we turn to questions, I have one question from Mr. Mohan Menon, which is on the lack of good neighborliness among the southern states, whether in the sharing of river waters, or in similar disputes, where there's much of bitterness that comes out rather than good neighborliness and some fellow feeling. How would you explain that? Well, that is a very important observation. In fact, that is uh, what, what I was kind of left with at the end of my research and my study. That, uh, yes, I, I think no, no, observer or student of the last hundred years or so can say that linguistic redistribution was an error. I think everybody would say that the opportunities that linguistic states have created for these speakers of the languages, who are the majority in each of these states, uh, have been immense and have, have more than justified the new boundaries. But it's also true that this, uh, you know, one very sad development has been that there were so many areas where uh, people of more than one language lived in substantial numbers. In the Kanyakumari region, the Palghat region, the, uh, uh, the region, you know, the, the hum, around Hampi, uh, where the Telugu, Telugu speakers and the Kannada speakers, in, in the Nellore area, Chennai itself, there were so many parts of South India where people of different languages lived together. Now, I think after the linguistic states and the new politics and other consequences of the new politics, there has been a, 
uh, a contraction in the in, in these mixed areas. And they're becoming more exclusively Tamil or Telugu or Kannada or Malayalam or whatever. And this has been a very sad, uh, uh, also um, consequence, you might say, of uh, the new arrangements. Uh, it is not something that can, uh, has to remain a permanent problem. But I think uh, the South has to realize that uh, the, the immediate neighbor, whether within the state, uh, boundaries of the state, the neighbor across the boundary, is also a very important part of our life. And, and you know, this concern for neighbor, love for the neighbor, is what the great South Indian uh, thinkers for centuries, not, ju not just Thiruvalluvar, even before him and after him, not just in the Tamil areas, but in all parts of South India, that care for the neighbor is the first duty of the, city, of, of the individual. This has been the Southern philosophy, not always practiced. Uh, and I think this is what is above all uh, needed now. Uh, and, and sometimes it is demonstrated also. You know, when, when the floods took place in Chennai four or five years ago, there was this amazing response from all parts of South India. And uh, all South Indians came together and the same is shown elsewhere. But the, it is undoubtedly true that this absolutely, uh, you might say, uh, uh, deplorable and, and strange and peculiar, illogical anger uh, at the neighbor who also needs water. You need water, they need water, and there's so many other, that this inability to respect and think for the neighbor is a really, is a, is a, is a rejection of repudiation of the wonderful culture in which the South has grown. Uh, now, if we could go to questions, Sujata, how do we handle it? Do you take over? So, Ravi, I'll uh, call out the questions from the yeah. chat box. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, Sushila. we have uh, one question which says, although the I'm not quite sure what this means, but it says, uh, although Southern states are more, but with uh, North and Western India, the having more population, that it becomes the deciding element. And then uh, Dravidian culture is actually the true Indian culture, isn't it? Surely the North has had many invaders. This comes from Anita. Mm. Ravi, would you like to answer those or shall I? Oh, no, they are addressed to you, basically. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> no, they are not interested in my views. So, <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> North had many invaders. Uh, you know, <clears throat> if you have invaders, it does not mean that you, you don't remain who you are. I think North also is very much Indian. And uh, it may have had in invasions. Uh, so I, I don't think we are holding out for some kind of absolutely pure, undefiled, untouched uh, uh, kind of situation. We're all, we're all the product of mixture, of contacts, of interactions. The South is. But yes, the Indian culture is a very important, proud part of Indian culture. Uh, and. Uh, People in the North need to understand and appreciate it. Uh, you know, the, how little the North knows about whether it's Thiruvalli or whether it is Vemana in Telugu country, whether the other great uh, thinkers, poets. Uh, this, this is a, a, a great gap. Uh, but we need not say that one part of, of South India is purer than other parts or one that the South Indian part of India is more purer than other parts of India. I agree, I know. Uh, then there is, but, uh, but one thing, I mean, totally uh, slightly frivolous, but how come 
75 years after independence, the North still refers to all the four states in one word, madrasis. That has never changed. How did we become so great? I mean, how come? I'm quite happy to be called a madrasi, but uh, I'm sure the other states are squirming. They are, but I think they are slowly winning the battle. I think the, the, the usage and terminology in the rest of India is changing. Changing? Okay, and that's good. It is, it is uh, very few people now refer to Kanadika as Malayalis. As that's Malayalis. nice. Okay. Um, how much of the Maratha influence still exists in southern states? Is another well, I think a good, a good deal of it, good deal of it continues to exist. The, it's an amazing story, the <coughs> Maratha rulers of Tanjavur, uh, who uh, continued for a long time. I mean, the Maratha empire, in a way, ended, but the Maratha cultural influence in southern India has continued and it resulted in so many interactions and contributed so much. And of course, I don't say that the Maratha rulers were responsible for the great poets that emerged, the singers, the musicians in Tanjavur, but they emerged during their, uh, their rulership. So uh, I, th I think the, Mar the Maratha influence is a, is a very important part of the South Indian story. I personally had two questions. One is, uh, can we, Although it seems a bit simplistic, geographical distance from the capital itself could be a factor in why we never feature in the national uh, leadership uh, scenario. Is that a possibility at all? Well, I think that's an excuse. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 you know, all it takes is for an individual to say, I want to take leadership take care of India as a whole. You know, some of the greatest figures in modern South Indian history, take, take uh, my maternal grandfather, Raj Gopalachar. He, any time if given a choice between Deputy Prime Minister of India and Chief Ministership of Tamil Nadu, he would have opted for the latter. He, he much preferred uh, to look after, to be involved with, his, his own part of, of India. You know, the taking leadership of all of India is a very, very tough task. It's not something that you others give you. It is something that you have to claim. Claim. Claim, you have to yeah. make it your responsibility. So now, I, you know, one of the questions that Ravi started with, you know, that South India is very different politically even today from the rest of India. And Hindu nationalism is not such, not such a strong drive in South India. South okay. India has other uh, great goals of Forces, equality, yeah. equality, compassion, uh, uh, care for the poor, the needy, care for women. Uh, women's rights is a very big thing in, in South India. So if given all these wonderful advantages, some people in today's South India were to say, look, India is a very major player in the world. India is our country too. And we will give a lead to all of India. You know, it's, it's a matter of resolve and commitment, not something that others will give you. What, uh, was Narsim Rao an exception? <clears throat> yes and no. I think Narsim Rao was a fortuitous prime minister, as we all know. Mm. And uh, he, he didn't want this. He, he was away in the United States, suddenly he came back, and then uh, Congress needed somebody. And uh, so, but then, and then Dev, Narsim Rao and Deva Gowda are the two South Indian prime ministers we've had so far. Uh, neither of them uh, cultivated uh, or ha had a passion to become. They, they may have all had ambitions or desires, and they perhaps uh, were, were absolutely stirred and thrilled when they became prime ministers. It would be human uh, to do that. But they, they did not plan. Uh, you know, to, to give India a new direction as such. Once Narasimha Rao became Prime Minister, yes, he and Manmohan Singh gave yeah, in Manmohan the economic Singh. sense anyway, a tremendous new direction. But, so I think here is, here is again to return to the point that uh, if South Indians among them, not just one or two, but a few of them, and especially people from different parts coming together and say, look what's happening. We're not happy with so much of what is happening in India. We want to give a new lead and South Indians will be the forefront, that would be a new day. 
And you were talking about neighbors and uh, lack of neighborliness and the caring for neighbors. Uh, surely a lot of that is driven by the economy. I mean, you can all be neighbors and we can all be friends. And, but when the dog is barking at your own door, I think uh, somewhere it changes. No, you're no longer. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just asking. You're, no, you're, you're right. Of course, when the economic situation becomes stark, you, you, you think of yourself and your family first. Of course. First, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, in, that's human nature. That's normal. That's perhaps it's even desirable. However, it's not every time that uh, it's a crisis situation. And much of the time, you have scope for planning and working with your neighbor, appreciating your neighbor, seeing what your neighbor and you can do together for, for a much larger community. And the Tamil culture particularly, but all across the South, has emphasized care for the neighbor care for the neighbor. So that is, has to be remembered. So, uh, does anyone else have any other questions? I don't see any in the chat box. If you have any, please do uh, unmute yourselves and ask the question. I don't see any. I think both Mr. Ravi and Mr. Gandhi covered the topic so comprehensively that I think it left very little room for questions. Thank you very much. It is uh, my pleasure. Normally, when people are introduced at the beginning, people say, I feel privileged, I feel honored and all of that. Honestly, I feel honored and privileged to be thanking two such wonderful people this evening. It is indeed a privilege uh, for me. Uh, it has been an extraordinary evening because all of us here, I would imagine 90% of us here are South Indians or maybe even more. And yet we all listened avidly to all that was said. The book, Mr. Ravi having, I love the way Mr. Gandhi said, you've read it more recently than I have. I thought that was so kind, but it also brought a little bit of, uh, you know, how much both of you have invested in reading this book and uh, you know, really uh, bringing it to us so lucidly. Thank you very much. It's been an extraordinary evening. You wanted to say to, something, sir? Yeah, 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 yeah. I want to say something. Uh, I want to, you know, we remember, of course, Keshav Desiraj today, but another person I remember very much is S. Muttaya. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, no, of course, I Keshav and I, Keshav and I grew up together, so I've known him from the age of nine. Okay. Oh, my. We were neighbors from Bombay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Wonderful. But you, but you, to go go to a, a Mr. Mutaya, yeah. I, I have uh, used a lot of his research, of course, for my study. But what an amazing historian, scholar, and you know, he loved information. He loved facts and uh, interesting facts. And there were others also who helped me uh, when I produced this book. So. I, I want to, okay, again, I'm stealing a, a minute or two more. Oh, please. That, that one purpose in writing this book was to stimulate, you know, no person, and certainly not anyone with my numerous limitations, could do justice to the incredible wealth of the history of modern South India. So I have made my initial effort. I hope more people will make their own effort write their own histories and unveil places that I could not open up to others. Anyway, thank you for giving thank me the you. Thank you. Thank you very much for a wonderful evening. Thank you, Mr. Ravi. Uh, thank uh, you. I think the interchange was, uh, the interaction between the two of you was what brought even more life to the evening. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rajmohan, and thank you, Sushila. And, uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, Sujata, again. Thank you so much. Thanks to Intac. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Good night, all. Hi, Sujata. Good night. Hello.